as we said, um, it's myself and Elliot Allerton, and we are both in the dental hospital for the day, hence why we're masked up. Um, uh, we are going to be talking about problem-based learning in a hybrid teaching model, and we're kind of going to just jump between the, the slides ourselves. So, obviously, myself, I'm a technology-enhanced learning lead, and Elliot's a senior programmer here, and uh, Pete Smith, who's not actually with us, is the, um, the PBL lead. So, yeah, we're both PBL tutors as well in the first year course. So I'll hand over to Elliot. So what is PBL? I'm sure everyone in the audience is familiar with this by now. It's problem-based learning. It's based around scenarios. Each week we have a real-world scenario. Um, the heart of the Marlboro man is one of them, an older man who smokes consistently. And then we explore various themes around that, such as the structure and function, the biology, the disease, the management, data interpretation. That'd be around how many percent of people smoke then develop cancers and what metrics you'd use to actually interpret that data. Public health, so prevention campaigns perhaps, and human behaviours and communication, so reluctance to change. And then professionalism, so how students are interacting with us and one another. We have two parts, an A and a B, part one and two, week apart from each other. First session is reading the scenario, creating the learning outcomes. The subsequent session is them sharing their knowledge and what they found for each learning outcome with one another. Um, and the session is normally student directed with um, a chief facilitating. Okay, so uh, the problem we faced obviously is that we wanted to maintain the kind of the QA and the feedback cycle that we already had um, existing with PBL, which obviously traditionally we run in a small group in a room together. Um, so uh, what happens is this, the session takes place and we as tutors give them feedback. The students sign off on that feedback and that's all synced up to the database um, where it's all collected together. And then at a, a clinical progress panel, that data is removed, uh, reviewed um, and decisions are actually made as to whether those students are appropriate. So during these sessions, we're observing them on their knowledge, their professionalism, their participation and whatnot. So we really needed to somehow be able to recreate the PBL process, but in a kind of a fully online method. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So COVID introduced a problem for us because we had no face-to-face -face teaching. The way we taught this was to have eight or so students sit around a large table and collaborate on a whiteboard with us leaving feedback on iPads. The software we had only worked on iPads and the iPads live in the dental school. So, um, as Elliot said, we have to come up with a solution of how we're going to get all these students to interact. The, the key aspect of PBL is the interaction between the groups, the six or seven members. Uh, we as PBL tutors are really just there to facilitate them. We're not really assessing their knowledge or we're not there to provide them with any information. We're simply there to guide them. Um, so we need to find some technology which would allow them to collaborate together. Um, as Elliot alluded to, normally that's done on a whiteboard in an office in a teaching room and students would take a picture of that and take it away. Um, so we had uh, explored various technologies and decided that OneNote class notebook would be the best uh, method forward. So that's the screenshot you can see on the left hand side here. So each group, so uh, UCP 1C was actually my group, had a shared workspace for each one of the scenarios and then those workspaces were broken up into the tasks. So during the session, the students read through the scenario make a mind map, and then they'll write some learning outcomes. Um, obviously, this was all facilitated by Microsoft Teams, so uh, students could interact and engage with, with each other. Um, and that technology actually proved to be quite well, uh, worked quite well. However, we obviously um, had the old age-old camera debate, so I'll have, have a look at CIE's website before this. and. Uh, the quote was overall most uh, experts agree shouldn't uh, students shouldn't have their webcams on. However, as part of um, PBL, it, it was an actual requirement that all students, unless they had technology issues, would have their webcam on. Um, one of the main purposes of PBL is for us to assess students' professionalism, and without being able to see how they see the students, it's very difficult to do that. So it was a requirement that they had the webcams on. And to be perfectly honest, the students didn't seem to have any issues with this. Um, and on the whole, I don't think I had any sessions where students were dressed in their pajamas or anything. They were mostly um, dressed appropriately. So yeah, it also lets you see whether they're playing on the phone as well instead of engaging and talking with one another. 
So um, the second part of this is how is this linked all to our um, QA system and our existing feedback. So Elliot's really going to talk about that. Yeah. So what we had to do is replace the the iPad technology that we had in place with an online web form. Um, we used the same web form as we had before, and then used our online portal to facilitate this. We then converted all the data together, packaged it all as one um, file. We sent it over to LiftUp's API, which took the data and the forms that we had filled out for that week, allowed it then to be processed into its database. And then following that, it showed up in the student's web interface and staff review panels as it would have before. So not only are we using the same forms and the same questions, but we're also getting the feedback back out the other end in the same way. Okay, great. Uh, so obviously the staff feedback, because predominantly the change was on the staff level, um, was that um, they thought that the, the notebook workspace provided an adequate space. Um, I've actually spoke to uh, some of the, the students for this, um, and they actually enjoyed the shared note, note space because uh, traditionally they would, if they found uh, information on topics, they would share it between each other in WhatsApp messages and other technologies. But now they had a kind of a collaborative space to actually use and share stuff, drop in PDFs, they can drop in bits of text enough uh, and, and so on. So students like that. Um, the staff obviously reported that the forms were easy to use. That, as earlier alluded to, they were an exact replica of what happens on the iPad. But um, we did kind of have a bit more flexibility with the iPad. You have to do the feedback there and then because there is a sign up process. Uh, with the remote forms, which we'll touch on in a minute, we haven't got the student sign off process. So you can actually finish your session and spend half an hour writing some real detailed feedback for the students. Um, so yeah, and then obviously the final one was uh, using Teams and remote forms allowed me to deliver the UCP. Um, we didn't have any issues with any of the tutors or those initial kind of jump in learning how to use all the technologies and some of the tutors are more technology savvy than others. So um, I think we're going to talk about the identified ish issues on the next slide yeah. as well. So, um, so obviously the student challenges, as I alluded to there, were kind of staff and student digital literacies. Some students could just get on with it when you sent them the link and others needed a lot of help. The same as I alluded to with staff, obviously myself and Elliot, both tutors, both very familiar with technology. Um, some of the other tutors are senior professors who couldn't use a computer to yeah. save their lives. So there was all, always that issue. Um, we've obviously touched on um, the Wi-Fi and computer hardware issues. Unfortunately, in a, in a hybrid model, when you're doing digital things, there's nothing you can do about that. If students have um, Wi-Fi issues, then they have Wi-Fi issues. And obviously the camera debate, um, Obviously, if students were having Wi-Fi issues, we advised them that they should turn their camera off to kind of improve the process. And then I don't know if Elliot, you want to talk about the sign up, sign up process. Yeah, so on Clinics, normally a student would review their feedback and sign it out. It's not really um, for them to negotiate their feedback. It's more for them to um, to get the opportunity to talk through the feedback with you. That process doesn't happen and hasn't been able to happen at the moment. We've got some ideas about how we could solve that. Or how we could bring that back in and it would be um, basically short meetings five minutes or so afterwards with each student walking through their feedback there and then um, we feel that's quite important because we'd want them to get all of their feedback before the next session and make sure they've actually seen it before the next session and some of the feedback we had from staff were that week on week they were making the same mistakes because there was a delay in their feedback sometimes they wouldn't get their feedback right away and that was for a variety of reasons like Matt said, you can actually leave the feedback after the session, which allows you to leave more detailed comments. But sometimes tutors would put that off until the end of the week, meaning that it, the feedback wasn't released to the students there and then it could take a week, which um, hadn't been possible before. OK, uh, and then just to, uh, uh, kind of moving on further from the remote forms aspect of it um, that we've gone on to since use it in a number of sessions, Elliot presented another uh, thing this morning on the remote forms, we've used it for clinical simulated cases and for comm sessions. So it basically allows any of our tutors to provide the same level of feedback as they would using the lift up system, but remotely from home, kind of in their own time. So um, there is some adaptability to it, and uh, we are seeing some further use, and we expect that next year it will be expanded even further. 
And I think that's all we've got. So if anybody's got any questions. Okay, thank you both. Um, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Elliot. That was really interesting. We've got a couple of questions. I don't know if you've seen them. The first one is from Jonathan. And he's asking, do you think this method of doing problem-based learning work better than traditional face-to-face -face sessions? And another question from Dean is about OneNote. Is the mind mapping software embedded into OneNote or were there mind maps hand-drawn? Uh, the mind maps were actually hand-drawn. The one example yeah. that I put up was oh, the best one I could find. We, um, that student actually did the mind map on an iPad. They were one of the more digitally yeah. literate students, so they actually hand-wrote that on their iPad. Um, so, yeah, but there isn't any mind map so software built in. Um, so, yeah. With regards to the second issue, I personally, for my group, felt, although it worked really well, um, for me, it was a bit harder to assess the students um, when um, online, because once people start sharing screens, yeah. everybody's pictures become small, and I can't really, it's difficult to tell who's speaking sometimes and whatnot. Yeah. So while it was a good uh, replacement, I don't think it's as good as in person, but yeah. I think it's as good as it could get for Elliot. I don't know if your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, with the whiteboards, we found that although it is synchronized, it, there is a delay in that synchronization. So as a student's drawing on it, you might not get that update for 10 or 20 seconds or so. Um, however, we started to have the student who's the chair, who's the scribe, um, actually share their screen with everyone so you could see what they were doing in real time. And that worked out quite well. Um, I think with first year students, uh, it'd probably be better to have them in the building in the same room to set clear boundaries and expectations. Um, sometimes it, it can be a little bit tricky to um, sort of get them at the level of professionalism and get them all to talk um, at home where with what I found is when they're in the building, they, they actually do talk to each other and engage with each other. 